you are listening to Action Design Radio, podcast of the Action Design Network, a globally recognized nonprofit organization dedicated to promoting all aspects of behavioral science. We bring you leading researchers and practitioners to discuss the latest behavioral science insights and how they can practically be applied to make a better world for all. Thanks for tuning in and enjoy today's episode. Hello and welcome to another episode of Action Design Radio. I'm your host, Zarat Khan. With me as always, also your host, Eric Johnson. Hi, Eric. Hello, Zarat, and hello, everyone else. <laughs> we are super excited to have with us today, John Levy, who uh, has a book coming out in um, just a couple of days here called You're Invited. John, thanks for joining us. Are you kidding? I'm super excited. Anytime I have an excuse to hang out with fun people and discuss geeky science, like that's my dream in life. Well, call us up anytime because that's literally uh, what Eric and I spend pretty much all day doing. And it seems like that's what you spend pretty much all day doing as well when you're not off on uh, some kind of crazy adventure. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, it's it's funny. I miss going on adventures a lot. It's been about a year and a half now. And I had this realization that, you know, I, I used to do these projects where every month I would travel to the biggest event in the world, mm-hmm. like running of the bulls. I got crushed by a bull and almost died in Pamplona. And then like, I went to Burning Man and like, you know, I'd, I'd go check these places out. And then I realized I was at home working like 12 to 16 hour days, sitting in front of Zoom. And the people I was talking to weren't nearly as charming as you and Eric. So <laughs> I felt like, oh my God, the moment this book is out, (laughs) I'm going to disappear. I can't wait to explore the world. I totally can relate to that. It's funny. I I did a little bit of light internet stalking of you in advance of this conversation, including looking at your Instagram. And I was like, okay, I feel like this guy and I have some some things in common because like pre-COVID, it was like, oh, like drinking delicious wine at some gorgeous vineyard, doing some crazy hike, beautiful vista, traveling here, this country, that country. And then, you know, for about 18 months, there's like six pictures there. <laughs> just like, like just been working. Here's another cat and yep. me on Zoom <laughs> wearing feeling. like pajama pants. And, yeah. We actually we actually used to have a running feature of this podcast, which is where in the world is Iraq because he was always somewhere else. Oh, uh, awesome. And so he's been in the same spot lately, but we're looking forward to bringing that back uh, over the next year, hopefully. Yeah, we all we all are. So, you know, John, I mean, tell us a little bit about how you know you kind of develop this behavioral science kind of expertise. It seems like you're a great translator of behavioral science, consumer of behavioral science. You're kind of running these little experiments in you know your kind of daily life all the time in really fun and interesting, adventurous social ways. So, you know, how'd you get kind of started on that journey? Well, I think it helped that I was incredibly unpopular growing up, <laughs> like super geeky. Back when, like back then, being a geek wasn't like a a cool thing. 12 whole parsecs like, ago. Yes, a few, <laughs> a few, a few <laughs> parsecs ago. The problem was that back then, until like the iPhone came out or Comic-Con became cool, uh, being a geek wasn't okay. Then like suddenly everybody saw themselves as geeky. It was kind of this funny cultural awakening. But I, uh, when I was, I think in my late 20s, I started working for a company called Rodale which owned men's health and women's health, runner's world, like all the health and fitness magazines. And I worked in their in-house agency. And my job was to develop digital strategies for different brands and companies. And uh, they had a library sciences team. And so I could ask them to pull any research I wanted on any topic, and they would organize it for me. And then I would actually use that research to produce strategies. It was this incredible resource. I loved it. And then I realized how good I was at kind of applying behavioral science. So there's so much work that comes out of academia that just disappears. It gets published in a journal and then nobody talks about it, especially because you know this, by the time a paper is actually published, it's taken so long that you're on to your next five projects. Uh, So things mostly disappear unless they get written up in some pop science book. And I really just love this idea that I could take all this knowledge and improve people's lives with it. I ended up taking a bunch of this research and over the years, 
uh, developing an expertise on how to connect people. And I designed the secret dining experience where 12 people are invited. They're not allowed to talk about what they do or give their last name. They cook dinner together. And when they sit down to eat, they get to guess what everybody else does. They find out that it's, you know, the president of a television network and the editor in chief of a magazine and the Nobel laureate and, uh, I don't know, an eight time Olympian or a celebrity or an Oscar winner. And over the years, I've hosted over 2,000 people at 227 dinners in 10 cities in three countries. Uh, and the reason that I was able to do it, having literally no status, no money, I was like totally broken in debt, was because I understood the mechanics of human behavior. So uh, that's really got, what got me interested. And then one of the dinner guests, a neuroscientist that you might know uh, by the name of Moran Cerf, um, said, John, I want you to start doing research with me. And so uh, we started collaborating on a bunch of projects and I used my relationships and my understanding and science of degrees uh, from NYU. I studied computer science, math and economics. I started doing research on, we did like the largest study in history on dating, I think. We looked at 421 million potential matches using the data from Hinge and found weird things like if you have the same initials, you're 11.3% more likely to date. Or we found a relationship between introversion and extroversion and uh, sh online shopping behavior. And we found, uh, we're now doing like a study on YouTube uh, ad e efficacy. So I, I ended up just doing peer reviewed research for kind of for the heck of it. <laughs> so I thought it was interesting. That is really interesting. I mean, and one thing that also kind of jumps out to me is that, you know, I think a lot of, behavioral scientists, but also even like comedians, right, often will say, you know, oh, I was really kind of like, you know, geeky or nerdy or sort of an outsider when I started. And that led them to be sort of an observer of, of human behavior because they had this sort of outsider status. And so they kind of noticed more of like sort of these, you know, peculiarities or peccadillas or little things that people do. Yeah. And so it's interesting that, uh, and maybe this is kind of like done in concert with you know, the, the sort of research role that you found yourself in, but, you know, I'm curious if that's something that like you sort of felt that you experienced, or if you were just kind of like, oh, I just love having all this research at my fingertips and being able to kind of connect it to what's around me. I, I would definitely agree about the observer element. You know, I was not the kid that was going to be most likely to be invited to the party. You know, the, and even if I was, I wasn't, particularly popular enough to be in the middle of the room. I was probably closer to being a wallflower. Now it's weird because I was an extrovert, but I just didn't know how to approach people and I didn't really feel comfortable around them. Yeah, I mean, it's it's also interesting because I mean, even just the phrase you used of like, oh, I wasn't likely to get invited to the party. It's like, you're now literally hosting yeah. all the parties, you know, <laughs> like thousands of parties. And so it is this kind of... Uh, I don't know, cosmic re retribution that you're having of uh, ma making up for lost time with thousands of parties and, you know, kind of the the first book, or at least that I read, I'm assuming this was your first book with the 2 a.m. principle. Yes. Of, um, I mean, it, it is like a guide, sort of a scientific guide to how to have a fun time, you know, how to have an adventure. GQ um, said it was the science of a perfect night out. I think. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, wow, that's pretty cool that GQ would say that about me. Um, I was like, it was one of those like, okay, maybe I could die today and we're done. Like, it's, it's totally fine. I've, I've achieved basically all I need. Achievement to unlocked. Yes, exactly. The, uh, I've platinumed this game. It's, uh, <laughs> nothing else needed because let's be honest, I'm never getting a Nobel prize. That was basically the best compliment I could get. So that's the next level. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>on that a little bit maybe walk us through you know one thing that's interesting i was kind of reading and learning through the books and stuff is that uh i think some of these things like connecting and influencing are topics that aren't often associated with behavioral science so 
maybe helpful to like walk through as you've gone through this journey and like end up going through this path, you know, what is some of like the key behavioral science behind some of these concepts? Uh, and, you know, our audience is generally into behavioral science and, you know, is familiar enough with the basic concepts, but they probably haven't thought about it in this context before. Uh, so we yeah. talked a little bit about that journey of how you, what some of those concepts are being and how you tested them and, and, uh, and learned through all that. So it's, it's kind of funny. I was sitting in a seminar and the seminar leader said that the fundamental element that defines the quality of our lives are the people we surround ourselves with and the conversations that we have with them. And I wasn't sure if that was true. And I think, and I'm curious if you've come across this as well, that there's so much stuff that's said by like gurus and like personal development junkies. And you hear them say stuff and you're like, are you just repeating that because somebody else said it? Or is that actually based in any reasoning? And so I came across a study by these two guys, Nicholas Christakis and James Fowler. And they were curious about the obesity epidemic. And they were curious, does obesity spread from person to person like a cold? Or is it a percentage of the population? A good example might be like Alzheimer's. All right, you probably won't get Alzheimer's hanging out with people who have Alzheimer's. And what they found was shocking, that if you have a friend who's obese, your probability of obesity increases by 45%. Your friends who don't know them have a 20% increased chance, and their friends have a 5% increased chance. And it turns out that this kind of behavior uh, is true for marriage and divorce rates, smoking habits, voting habits, Basically, anything is contagious. And it made me realize that if I want to have an effect on my life, what I should probably stop doing is getting mad at myself for hitting the snooze alarm when I set it for 6 a.m. to go to the gym, because that was never going to happen. And accepting that, and then instead saying, okay, maybe if I was friends with more fitness professionals, exercise would be part of my routine. And so I decided that I'd commit myself to affecting my life, to influencing the outcome of the things that are important to me by connecting with the people who are the experts in that, those that I admire the most. The problem is that if you're 28, broke, and in fact, in debt, have no social status, how on earth are you going to connect with the most influential people in our culture? And that's when you have to look at the advice that you get because it doesn't make any sense. Eric, if you're starting off in your career, they say relationships are important. Thereby, you should go to events and you should start doing what? Networking. Oh my God. Nobody wants to network. It is literally the worst. It makes us feel like we're dirty. And research by Francesca Gino from Harvard Business School, who I wouldn't be surprised if you two know her and had her on this show before. She's brilliant. They looked at the implicit association with networking and found that people feel dirty, like they need to wash. And that shouldn't surprise us because anything that makes that many people uncomfortable probably isn't such a great idea from a social perspective. What's interesting is that they found that that same experience doesn't exist if we talk about making friends. So, Zarak, are you introverted, extroverted? Where do you think you fit on that? Extroverted, yeah. And Eric? Uh, I think I'm actually kind of an ambivert, but I'm definitely on the introverted side of the spectrum. I would consider myself a full-on introvert, but I'm much so more So here's what's interesting. Sure. Regardless of which one of you, my hunch is both of you enjoy making friends. The question might be at what scale or how many at a time, but the joy of making a new relationship is probably true for almost every person. Eric, is that accurate? I don't want to put words in your mouth. Yeah, for sure. I would agree. So then the question becomes, okay, if I'm actually going to meet people and connect with them, then how do I do that? And it might be a little bit simpler than we realized because human beings connect in general over interest, activities, and culture, right? So I know Zorak is a huge stamp collector, and so am I. So we just can geek out over stamps. Big time, from way back. Huge. 
I have a large collection of forever stamps in case I never need to mail anything. But all kidding aside, you can see that that's an, if we both were interested in that, we'd bond over it quickly. Whereas Eric, if you're, is there a sport you're really into? Please say Quidditch, please say Quidditch. Uh, I would, this is gonna be embarrassing. I've, I've actually never read or watched Harry Potter, so I'm not a Quidditch. Uh, to, I'll be to directing but, uh, the rest of my questions today. To <laughs> so, Think of all the people you could have bonded with over Harry Potter that you I know, you're not I'm able to now. now. Uh, let's say uh, football. Great. So if you know that other people are really into football, you can either participate in the game or watching it, right? And that's a great way to bond with people. Or if you, there's a cultural experience that's really relevant to you. So if you are from the same religion or culture, you can celebrate holidays together. So people tend to connect over that kind of stuff. But the issue that I faced was that that's not going to be enough to connect with like the CMO of a global conglomerate, right? They're being approached a hundred times a day by people being like, my nephew needs an internship. <laughs> Your company should buy my company, you know, and all these kind of like silly requests. So I need to find a way around that. And at the basic level, I realized that I need to do something generous so that it wouldn't raise any concerns that I was trying to take advantage of them. And the important thing is that when I talk about generosity, I don't mean, oh, I'm gonna give you a bunch of stuff. Because Eric, have you ever been to a party with a swag bag? Uh, I don't know about party, but it, it depends on if I'm party, but like a conference or something. Yeah. Like, yes, absolutely. What do you do with the swag bag? Mostly throw it away. Yeah. yeah, nobody wants more stuff. You don't even want to be taken to like a corporate dinner. You're like, yeah. I'm happy eating my own food and paying for it if I don't have to listen to your spiel, right? So that's not the kind of generosity I mean. I mean, the generosity of connections, information, knowledge, resources, that kind of stuff. I don't want more free junk that I don't need, right? And that's fundamentally a starting point for building trust. The second thing is that it has to be novel. So I'll give you an example. If we look at uh, the invitations that high profile people get, it's probably a whole lot of people offering to take them out for coffee in exchange for their opinion. That is really unappealing if you could afford to buy your own coffee shop, right? Like if you are so successful, then the last thing you need is a free cup of coffee. In fact, I will gladly pay for your coffee if I could just have an hour of work time. So if I'm gonna get noticed by them, I need to try, uh, trigger something called the SNVTA. That's the major novelty center of the brain. And it responds relative to how novel something is and actually entices us to explore and understand it. So when I offer you something that's generous and novel, you suddenly go, huh, what is that? This sounds so interesting. It's why my dinners are free. And if you also notice 90 something percent of the attendees have no business value to me. Like what am I going to do in terms of business with a Nobel laureate or an Olympian? Like it's just irrelevant and it's, a novel design. They cook dinner together. They get to guess what everybody does. They can't talk about work. It fundamentally stands out. And then there's a third characteristic, which is, Zarak, who do the most influential people in our culture spend their time with? Well, they spend their time with their families, other like the folks that they well, work now with. Now everybody's locked at home with them. So yes. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, well, I'll, I'll, this is where I get to prove that I actually read the book. They spend a lot of this time with their, uh, with their staff as well. Yeah. The people that are kind of like managing their schedules and their hand handlers, that sort of thing. And that's, what's kind of interesting when you ask people, okay, who do influential people spend their time with? They always say, oh, they're influential people. But if that were the case, then there wouldn't be any need for events like Davos or TED, where there are these large groups of curated influential people we'd instead have all those people around us all the time. But what got most of these people their status is that they spend their time working <laughs> with their staff. And so if you can curate an environment with other interesting people, we'll go far out of our way for it. Now, mind you, this won't appeal to every single person, but you'll never find anything that does. 
But you'll also notice that at my dinners, we curate interesting people. And no, I know the next question is always like, did it start off that way? No. <laughs> my parents are immigrants. I didn't know fancy people growing up. I, uh, the first dinner I ran was not like, you know, major celebrities and Academy Award winners. It was interesting people. And then every time I ran the dinner, I became progressively more interesting and, and successful and noteworthy. And it's been 227 dinners. So like, so it's kind of it, crazy. It's interesting too. I mean, the, I mean, there's a lot of really interesting stuff in what you just said. One thing that jumped out to me is, you know, you have, I think one of the things that people find distasteful about networking is that it sort of combines these things that don't really mix, right? So it's sort of this like relational kind of supposed to be fun atmosphere with a very like transactional um, yeah. element, you know, of like, hey, great to meet you. Like, are you really great to meet me? Or are you like walking around reading everyone's name tag to see like who is the most like influential, you know, person here? Let me pretend to make eye contact when I'm really checking which company you work at. Right, exactly. There's like a joke, right, of like, you know, shaking people's hand while like scanning the rest of the room to sort of mm -hmm. see who all, who all is there. So, you know, I like that you've kind of you know, identified this and sort of taken it out of the picture for, you know, your, for your dinners. I'm, I'm kind of curious. So, you know, in, in the book, you talk, there's sort of these different levels of influencers, right? So it's folks in kind of your personal life, com community level, industry, it's kind of global influencers, as your dinners have evolved, like, how did you, you know, did you sort of recognize at each point, like, oh, this is like a different type of person that's now here. Was there like a moment like that? Or was it sort of upon oh, reflection, you were like, oh, you know what, looking back on all these dinners, there's some differences across this. Uh, it was the latter. Over 227 dinners, and hopefully in September, I'll be starting up again the changes are so gradual that you don't notice them until someone like you asks a question and then you start thinking about it. Uh, and I think that's how it is mostly in life, that any behavioral change or, or lasting impact happens piece by piece. And everybody wants that like, oh, I did my first dinner and nobody cool was there. And then I did my third dinner and suddenly Richard Branson came with Oprah. That doesn't really happen, right? Like, and also I'll say that it's probably not in our best interest if it did. You know, the research has generally shown that we're happiest when we feel a sense of progress. Mm -hmm. And in, if I won an Academy Award for Best Actor at seven, I don't know really where I'd go from there. I'd probably be less happy than if I never won one and kept progressing towards something. Yeah, so, I mean, that's, that's interesting, right? You're kind of touching on... I mean, the way that I would think about that or maybe interpret that is almost like we call like hedonic adaptation, right? Like as oh, yeah, things yeah. are getting better, you're sort of like the treadmill, right? So you're, you know, you, you start to get used to it. So in thinking about that, you know, and feel free to decline to answer this if it sort of would be, it might be a, kind of a rude question actually, but as a, uh, you know, thinking back on the early dinners, is it sort of like these folks are just as interesting, you would still have the same experience getting together or do you feel that influence is sort of like uh has the same element of adaptation where, you know, you kind of are, you know, <clears throat> looking for sort of the next, next thing always. So I think there's two answers. One is at that point in my career, those people were really interesting to me because I had no exposure to anybody, right? Like I was 28 and looking back, I, it's like an idiot, right? The other side of it is that as the dinners progressed, we became more and more diverse for the people that we invited because we began to see how incredibly varied different industries are. So when you invite the probably world foremost expert on venomous animals, like that's not something that ever occurs to you, right? Like why would I ever suddenly say, oh, we need to find this guy. I found him by accident. Super interesting guy, Zoltan Takis. National Geographic Explorer, phenomenally interesting. And that doesn't go away, right? He doesn't have a Nobel Prize. He's not a billionaire. He's not like, you know, doesn't have any of those like major things that people think are important or status symbols. But because of the variety or the diversity of talent and knowledge and resources and so on, 
the stories are amazing. And so after doing this many of them, the status isn't important, right? Like I've kind of gotten past that in my own mind. It's more, what fascinating story can I hear here? Like who's going to be my next bestie that I'm going to enjoy hanging out with? And that becomes more important to me. And also who should they know and who should I connect them with within the community that would increase the bonds and the density of connections between people? Because the fact is that if we are talking about, let's say influence, like you mentioned, I would argue that our influence is a byproduct of three factors. One is who we're connected to, because it's really hard to influence people we're not connected to. The second is how much they trust us, because if somebody doesn't trust you, it's going to be hard to influence them. You might be able to use reverse psychology, I don't know. And then the third is the sense of belonging or community that you have. And the reason I bring that up is because if I'm sharing an idea that I think is important and I tell you about it, and I also know Eric and you two know each other, then you're more likely to discuss it. And that compounds the impact of it. And so the more social ties between the people that I know, the greater the likelihood that an idea can spread or a cause can be affected and so on. The more belonging people feel in general seems to have a major impact on people's lives. So this is something that you describe in the book as the influence equation. Yeah. Um, it's not the kind of equation you try and solve, right? It's not like the Pythagorean <laughs> theorem or something. Like that. I, I, I was told there was not going to be math in this conversation. Yeah. So. <laughs> um, you know, I'm, I'm curious. And, and Eric, maybe... we can go straight to nap time if you prefer. <laughs> <laughs> right. When you were um, kind of coming, coming up with this, uh, you know, the, this equation, right? Um, was this also sort of just based on reflection on kind of what seen over the course of the influencers dinner? And, and were there things where you were like, you know, I'm, I'm always curious as to what people cut out of this stuff, right? Because there's always stuff oh, that's sort of like, yeah. you know, things that are like kind of on the side that, you know, they affect it. And you're like, oh, is this in here? And I'm like, well, no, I needed to be three things, and not four. So I'm <laughs> going to cut it down to three. So, you know, was there anything like that for you? Or was it kind of like, you know, this sort of came fully formed from your mind. No, no, that <laughs> does anything ever come. Anybody who tells you, oh, it came fully formed from the mind probably doesn't remember the actual process. <laughs> I can respect, right? But listen, not, I, I'm personally not that smart. I'm not. Uh, uh, so I used to say that our influence is a byproduct of who we're connected to and how much they trust us. And then I continuously struggled with this idea of network density, right? So I say network density, I'm not talking about networking. I'm talking about if you kind of map the relationships between people, it seems that the more they're connected to each other, the greater the impact is, right? So like, if you have no friends, your probability of getting coronavirus is probably very low because there's nobody to give it to you. If you're connected to a thousand people, you probably shouldn't go out in public because one of those people and you hang out with them, we'll give it to you. So researchers have found a bunch of these kind of funny relationships around belonging. So here's an interesting one. When you look at the greatest predictor of human longevity, it's not that awesome kale cleanse that you did last week, right? Or the amount of time you spent doing underwater Pilates or whatever it is like that's hot these days. It's really basic. Number two, and this is after genetics, which we currently can't control. Number two is close social ties. And number one is social integration. If you're embedded in a community, when you look at kind of predicting corporate success can be associated to the level of oxytocin in people's bloodstream, how much belonging they feel. The greatest predictor of team success is psychological safety this feeling like you're not going to be exiled from the group if you have an opposing view. And I couldn't escape it. And then eventually I wrapped my head around this idea that, okay, 
if I have greater ties with more people, then my ideas, the things I care about, have a better chance of spreading. And not only that, there's this really kind of funny thing. So, Zorak, let's say we become friends. And I hadn't met Eric yet. Let's say that. Let's just Let's say, say that. Theoretically. <laughs> hey, bestie. Uh, so, and I haven't met Eric yet. There's a theory that states that you'll introduce me to Eric because I am limited to the number of social ties I can actually maintain. And if I hang out with Eric, who's very close with you, I'll have to give up a social tie somewhere else, which brings me closer to your orbit. And then... I could have a more positive impact on your life and you have more influence on life, right? Well, let's do yeah. that. <laughs> so, hey, nice to meet you. Yeah. <laughs> hey there. <laughs> so that brings in this interesting idea that, okay, if there's a real sense of community between us, it actually does have an impact on our influence. And so that's when I integrated this additional idea of community. Um, but it's hard, kind of harder to wrap your head around this, like, at least for me, that, you know, knowing a lot of people who know each other, that's going to make me more influential. Like, yeah, I get it. The problem is that we're used to thinking of influence, which as like number of Instagram followers, <laughs> and none of those people are connected to each other, right? Like it, it, there's no sense of belonging because it's just somebody shouting photos at you. Yeah. I mean, uh, it can't be hard to wrap or your head around that, but I, I'm actually just thinking as we, so something that occurred to me as we were talking is that I think all three of us are into behavioral science now, but none of us have a formal background in it. Mm. Um, and interestingly enough, I think a lot of what we were talking about is sort of how, at least I can speak for myself, and I think it's pretty similar for Zrock, but uh, a lot of how we sort of end up doing this kind of work is through, we were interested in it and we ended up meeting a lot of people that sort of helped us get into it and building that community. and action design is uh, a big part of what we built or you know, attempted, intended to build was this community of people who are interested in behavioral science. So it's almost like a, you know, an organization that is uh, behind this podcast um, in a lot of ways represents this kind of thing in that there's this group of us that were like, you know, I was at one point where read some behavioral science books that are super interesting, but didn't have anybody to talk to about it or it didn't have any, oh, like, interesting. Yeah. at the time, there wasn't even really like grad programs or anything where I could go and like study it and start doing it. So, uh, yeah, you know, this I mean, did people not exist when I was that that and stuff. Yeah, exactly. Um, and that's really how at least a big factor of myself getting into this kind of work and hopefully our listeners and other people that come to our events as well. Interesting. So I guess the question is, how can we apply the principles in this book to make your gatherings more remarkable now we're getting fun questions um, uh, do you actually want to do this let's see I'll say let's, so, yeah. let's do it all right so yeah. here's i'm going to put some basics into place okay one is that we want to be really clear how many people are we going to be gathering so typically uh let's say 100 wonderful digital or in, in person in person great Non-COVID then, times in person. Yeah, yeah no, well, I'm sort of saying no, ideal, yeah. we'll say six months from now. You can right? gather a hundred people in person in, in like an open space. That's actually yeah, not a problem. Well ventilated, like, yeah. yeah. You could do it at a park. I mean, that's yeah. not a problem at all. True. Bring some speakers. That, that, would be a, that would be a novel way to do an action design meetup, actually. So now what's the intention of the uh, intended outcome of the experience? So I'll, I'll take a crack and then Eric, yeah, tell me where I'm wrong. So uh, there's typically three. One is uh, sort of socializing, meeting people. And that's typically mm -hmm. how the event sort of starts. They're, they're kind of formulaic in this way, but typically starts with sort of like meet people, you know, have time to kind of like chat and catch up. And it's sort of like knowledge transfer from some, someone like any of us on the call or other practitioners or researchers in behavioral science. And then some kind of like professional development piece of so people will say, hey, I'm hiring or that type of thing. Great. Okay. So the first thing uh, we could do is just here are just some random ideas. I love like, it. Add some novelty. Yeah. <laughs> so we want people to care more. So let's see if we can put into place something that Dan actually worked on, the IKEA effect. 
Mm -hmm. The IKEA effect is that people disproportionately care about their IKEA furniture because they had to assemble it. If you'll notice at my events, I have people cook. So my curiosity is what kind of effort can we make people put in? Now, it doesn't have to be huge effort, but it could be anything from volunteering their time to support something, right? So there's a, a Creative Mornings has a bunch of tables set up when they have their events where people say, oh, this is the connections table. Let us know if you want to connect with people and we'll find you people to connect with. And people volunteer their time and they run it. Then there's putting in effort like, oh, we've created a game. We're going to have people play a game together. And you could literally invent Jeopardy based on behavioral science uh, and have people shout out answers and call on them and give them really stupid, completely uh, like unneeded prizes. Like mm -hmm. if anybody can figure this out, uh, the winner of this question will receive this half used roll of tape. Right? <laughs> and you will see people are like jumping for the chance to answer a trivia question uh, in front of people, right? And you can make all of the, the trivia questions based on behavioral biases, latest research, fun fact. Uh, you can have people raise their hand and say, okay, uh, if anybody wants to share, you have three sentences to share the results of a study you just heard about. Right. And suddenly you have audience participation. So they feel really engaged and then you have shared knowledge. And so suddenly people will say, oh, you're the person that afterwards they'll say, oh, you're the person that shared about the pratfall effect. Oh, that's so cool. I love that. And then they have reasons to connect with each other more. So suddenly you're adding little novel experiences throughout that cause people to invest effort and care more and also receive social recognition from the, the uh, group. My recommendation is add some play. People really need play these days. We're so worn out. You could do this as a digital event where you put people into breakout rooms and have them play and then email like the group leader the answers and have a speaker and all that. And it goes amazingly well. And that way you can have people from across the country keep the community going until it can actually gather. I love that idea or those, the, those ideas. I mean, they're very consistent with, I think we've tried to build a lot around intrinsic motivation, you know, and like providing people with social connection, developing sense of mastery, mm -hmm. um, fun, that sort of thing. But, but, you know, and I, even in your response there, I'll, I'll kind of maybe tie it back to one of the things I really liked about the book, which is that I, I thought that you did a really nice job of kind of talking about you know, behavioral science concepts or principles broadly, as well as really getting in some cases, like very specific in terms of like tactical stuff. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, I think the chapter, the section on like the influencers and how to like kind of engage with people at different levels of influence. There were things in there where I was like, oh, this is just sort of like kind of very common. I mean, not common sense, but it was just like things like, you know, oh, like about the, um, you know, they spend a lot of time with their staff. So like that is sort of like yeah. one, you know, it's like, oh, you're gonna have to get past these people. And it's like, oh yeah, this is like just very practical advice of like, this is how this situation plays out all the time. You'll have to sort of plan or design for that. So, you know, your response just then or kind of walking us through that, I think reflected that this element that I really liked in, um, in really both of the books, but I think particularly in, in this most recent one, you're invited where it kind of goes from these concepts to, really practical ways of kind of applying these things. And here's what I, I first of all, thank you for that. That's, I, I've worked really hard to take the science, make it really clear on where the rubber meets the road. So it doesn't just feel very heady and then give people a few examples so that it could inspire themselves. One of the important things I, I keep coming back to in the book is that human connection actually doesn't cost any money. You look at like the most bonded communities, they don't tend to be wealthy, right? In fact, wealth tends to isolate people, right? Mm -hmm. You're in your home with your staff and they take care of everything and you don't need to invest effort into things in the same way. That doesn't appeal to me. And our events, we have people bring bottles of wine and we cook dinner together and the food doesn't cost that much. What costs a lot for me is the traveling around the country uh, and the staff to, to manage it. But nobody's doing things at the scale I do, right? Like major corporations like Ted do and summit and all that. But like, it's uh, these kinds of games that I just mentioned don't cost anything. 
you can actually create an incredible sense of belonging for people with virtually no money and just a bit of creativity and effort. And once you've gotten the formats down, then it, it kind of carries itself. So we have one format called 19 Questions, where at our salons, after the dinners, we host these salons, we have about 60 to 100 people come and we have three highly regarded speakers present, each one for 12 minutes. And every so often we'll just grab somebody who's in the audience and we'll say, okay, we're playing 19 questions. You have 19 yes or no questions to figure out what this person's famous for. And then they'll find out that it's Alan Cumming or Nobel laureate, so-and-so, whatever it is. But it, it allows for a deeper sense of audience participation so that you're just not sitting there passively. You're now actively thinking because the moment you're sitting passively, you're no longer actually thinking, right? Most people listen, accept, and then occasionally think. And so I want people engaged. So we redesign the way that we do those things. It's interesting, you know, it's, it's interesting to think about some of these perspectives from that behavioral science perspective, because it almost seems like someone not, a lot of things in behavioral science always seem obvious in retrospect, right? But like mm -hmm. the idea of just like add these really simple novel things and it makes it so much more memorable. And that's like availability heuristic, like stuff that stands out, like I remember more. And I think especially with like events and gatherings, so much stuff mm -hmm. is so similar that it's really not necessarily that difficult to do something that's that much different. Um, oh yeah. Add like special tweaks to things, right? That I'm so really in agreement. Uh, the number of times I've been to corporate events where I see the team moving flowers rather than talking to guests, it's like embarrassing, right? That, that's not what they're going to remember. They're going to remember the conversation they have with you if it's good. They're not going to remember if the flowers were on a 42 degree angle versus a 57 degree angle. So get over yourselves. Like nobody cares about that stuff. They're not going to remember the food unless you hired a Michelin star chef. They're not going to remember the drinks. The fact is that we should probably be serving less alcohol at these events to begin with. It's not a healthy habit and we shouldn't be promoting drinking considering the number of people who are sober, right? Like there's just a lot of things that we really need to question when we design these things. And, uh, but at least to me, the most important thing is that we find ways to bring people together because we are far too isolated right now. So to close on that note, you know, there are probably going to be folks that listen to this that want to connect with you in some way or the uh, material you've produced, the book or other uh, things that people should check out. So what are the best ways for people to sort of keep up to date with everything that you're doing and get a copy of the book? I send a carrier pigeon out once a week to all my readers. <laughs> uh, that's not, perfect. Not, not novelty once again. <clears throat> yep. Um, Here's my home phone number. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so the easiest way to get a hold of me is through my website. You can just, uh, there's a form, John Levy, T L B J O N L E V Y T like Thomas, L like Lion, B like boy. And, uh, it's, uh, there's forms you can fill out or you could just, uh, message me on Instagram, John Levy, T L B or clubhouse or anywhere else that human beings connect. And then the, other thing is that if you're looking to get a copy of my book, uh, you're invited the art and science of cultivating influence. You can find it on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, uh, independent bookshops, literally any place that you can find a book. It'll probably be there. Awesome. Um, you should check for airports. I don't even know if there are bookshops at airports anymore. I haven't been in one for so long. I just flew for the very first time in over a year last weekend. And I can confirm bookshops in airports still exist. Still Amazing. thing. I'll, I'll be taking my first next week uh, since, uh, since what, February 2020. So, holy cow. I, I will do some research. I will do some scouting and see if I can find it. Pick up a yeah. few copies if you see it at a bookshop. Yeah. And if it's not there, <laughs> just for the whole family. bring it there. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. We'll that's so there. funny. <laughs> that's like you're totally banksying my book. <laughs> I'm gonna... I'll, si I'll sign it like it's like from you and we'll see if anybody notices the difference. <laughs> that's so cool. Um, John, thanks so much for joining, uh, joining us. Really enjoyed the book, enjoyed the conversation. Um, looking forward to what you do next. 
Thanks so much for having me on, Eric and Zarak. You two are awesome. Thanks. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. We'll talk soon. See ya. Thank you for listening. That concludes this edition of Action Design Radio, hosted by Eric Johnson and Zarak Khan. All podcast episodes are available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, and many other platforms where you might typically get your pod on. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Special thanks to Morgan Bortz for design. And as always, we would like to recognize Steve Wendell, founder of the Action Design Network, a nonprofit organization dedicated to spreading awareness about behavioral economics, psychology, and all things behavioral science in order to help you improve your life, your career, and your understanding of the world around us and the people in it. I am your producer and audio engineer, Zach Simon. For more cutting-edge behavioral science content, visit action-design.org. Once again, that's action-design.org. There, you can sign up for our newsletter and find an in-person event happening near you. We have chapters in over a dozen cities in the United States and Canada. Also, on our website, you can find additional notes and links regarding the topics discussed in today's episode. Thank you again for tuning in, and we will see you again soon.